Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on the agenda item, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those who wish to speak in favor, for those who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly into the, into the microphone when you come to the podium. Each side, those wishing to speak in favor of an item and those wishing to speak in opposition to an item have 10 minutes to present each side. The time will be divided amongst all persons wishing to speak. If you are here opposing the rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what's called a protest petition. A protest petition can be helpful to those residents who live in the rezoning area. Please consult the planning staff for any details on a protest petition and they will be happy to help you. You should also keep in constant touch with the planning department as to when your case will go before the elected officials for a final vote. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can we have a roll call? Commissioner Beachwood? Present. Commissioner Beeland? Present. Commissioner Boyd? Present. Commissioner Davis? Commissioner Gibbs? Vice Chair Harris? Present. Chair Jones? Present. Commissioner Huff? Yes. Commissioner Lamb um, asked to be excused on tonight. Commissioner Paget? Present. Commissioner Smusky? Here. Commissioner Walters? Here. Commissioner Whitley? Commissioner Winders. Yeah. All right, thank you. I, and I did receive an email from uh, Fred Davis today asking for an excused absence. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Good evening, Commissioners. Pat Young with the Planning Department. No adjustments to the agenda, but I can certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with law, and there are affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do we have approval of the minutes? Mr. Chair, I move approval of the minutes. Second. David Harris. All right. Seconded by. It was approved by um, David Harris, approved by Melvin Whitley. All right. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? Let it be known by raising your right hand. Minutes have passed 11 to zero. All right, thank you. We move down to item five, public hearing, plan amendment, zoning map change, Ellis Road Residential, plan amendment A1300008, and zoning case Z1300026. Good evening. I'm Hannah Jacobson with the Durham Planning Department, and I'll be presenting thank the you. plan amendment case A. 13-00008 for Ellis Road Residential. The applicant in this case is Teague Hankins Development and they're proposing to amend approximately 15.5 acres of the future land use map from low density to low medium density residential. Um, this would allow the maximum density on the site to increase from four units per acre to eight units per acre. The proposal affects uh, one parcel that's located in the suburban tier. Um, it's on the east side of Ellis Road and north of Sohai Drive. Here's a map showing the broader um, area with the future land use map superimposed on top. Um, the Durham Freeway uh, runs down the center of the screen um, and the subject site is north of the Research Triangle Park which on the screen is shown in teal. Um, Generally speaking, there is uh, a ring of somewhat more intense land uses that surround the park. These include um, some industrial, some commercial, some office, and some higher intensity residential. I would like to point out that this um, pink site here on the screen, which indicates office on the future land use map, is um, currently being developed or is, is construction is near completion for um, some apartments. Um, as I mentioned in the staff report, there have been a number of changes to the future land use map um, over time for this area. Um, in fact, there have been two cases that were initiated and approved by the governing bodies 
um, that determined that low medium density was an appropriate use uh, for this area. Those are listed on the screen. Um, and in their justification statement, the applicant suggests that um, the requested land use pattern um, matches the adopted pattern in the area. It would also act as a transition between lower intensity uses further north and the higher intensity uses to the south, and that it helps to form a more contiguous pattern of growth that does not overburden the existing infrastructure. So staff has reviewed the request against the four criteria for plan amendments that are found in the Unified Development Ordinance. We found that the proposed amendment uh, is consistent with land use, consistent with land use policies, um, including those that um, deal with density and contiguous development. We also found that the proposal is not out of character with the established land use patterns or with recent development trends. It creates a logical transition from those more intense uses, including RTP and the apartment complexes to the south and um, to the lower intensity residential neighborhoods further north. We also determined there not to be any substantial adverse impact with regard to infrastructure, environmental protection, or with demand for future land uses. And finally, staff um, determined that the site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed use. So we are recommending approval of the plan amendment. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. This is Zoning Map Change Case Z1300026 for the uh, parcel that it, uh, spurred the plan amendment request. So this is, the applicant is Teague Hankins Development Corp for Ellis Road Residential. This uh, parcel is within the city's jurisdiction and the present designation is Residential Suburban 20 and the proposed designation is Planned Development Residential at a density of 7.341. The site is 15.53 acres and um, not just the proposed use but the committed use is 90 townhouses. The site is within the suburban tier at 1443 Ellis Road. It does have frontage along Ellis Road and NC 147 Highway. Um, it's south of Rated Drive and north of Sohide Drive. And towards the uh, bottom of this context map is the upper boundary of Research Triangle Park. The request uh, does meet the standards of the Planned Development Residential District. It requests a density of 7.341, which satisfies or accommodates the ni proposed 90 townhouses, and it meets the other standards of the PDR district. The existing conditions on the site show that there are a, a, a couple environmental features, including stream tributaries, uh, wetlands, there's a s wetlands are associated with the stream, there's a farm pond up towards the frontage of Ellis Road, there is also steep slopes towards the rear of the site, uh, as well as uh, other conditions on the site. It, it's mostly forested. There's a residential structure towards Ellis Road and a power line that uh, splits the site approximately in the middle. The proposed condition shows two building envelopes, one on either, uh, one on either side of the stream tributaries, there's a site access point, one on Ellis Road, and there's, actu there's two others uh, for cross ac access easement to the northern parcel, so a total of three access points. The tree coverage area is shown, uh, including areas within the stream buffers as well as along NC-147, as well as a possible stream crossing at this location. There's a number of commitments, 90 townhouses is the maximum unit count and housing type. Again, one potential stream crossing. There's actually three site access points, one site access point onto Ellis Road, two are cross, cross access um, to the parcel to the north, impervious surface at 70% and tree preservation at 20%. The graphics 
that you see on the proposed map that I showed you are all committed, as well as uh, there's four text amendments, including the housing type, dedication of right-of-way along Ellis Road frontage, uh, improvements associated with turning into the site at Site Access 1, and accommodating the bicycle lane by providing four additional feet of asphalt. The request is not consistent with the future land use map. As we've heard, the uh, requ um, request for the plan amendment, it is, um, this should be no, um, for not consistent with low density residential, but it is does satisfy the other policies of the comprehensive plan. And staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved, this request would be consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. We have one person signed up to speak for Mr. Jared Evans. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. Here representing uh, Tom Hankins with T. Hankins Development. Uh, I'll be very brief. I don't have much to add beyond uh, the staff report that uh, Hannah and Amy summarized. Uh, we do think this would be a nice transition between the apartments to the south and this single family to the north. Um, the site will also provide another housing option. Uh, the, that corridor of Ellis Road, I'm not aware of any townhomes available in that corridor of Ellis Road, so uh, we thought townhomes would make a lot of sense on this property. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting on September 3rd. Uh, we had three people in attendance. There is no opposition that I'm aware of. Um, again, short and sweet. I'm glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. No one else wishing to speak. I'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do we have anyone sign up to speak? Mr. Smusky. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question for Hannah or anyone who can answer it. What is the density of the uh, apartment uh, apartment complex being built? Um, I'm not positive of the exact density. However, they can go to a maximum of 10 and a half in the O&I zoning district. Okay, so, all right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edens, everything on this property seems to be either a hill or a swamp. Um, I was curious how you're going to build on these hills. Are you going to have to grade everything? Are you going to be able to terrace it a bit? I mean, typically for a townhome development, there's, there does end up being quite a bit of grading because you've got larger pads for the townhomes. We'll have driveways, parking aisles, things like that. So, um, I mean, I've seen worse sites, that's for sure. All the good land was built on a long time ago. Oh, of course. Uh, but, I mean, we will be, will be staying out of the wetlands and the, and the stream buffer. And we'll have one crossing shown on the plan, but the rest of it will be unpreserved or remain preserved. Okay. Mr. Gibbs. Uh, this question is for you, too. Uh, I have, I think we all may have gotten contacts by, from different people about uh, historical uh, aspects of this site uh, and some of the naturalist things uh, like certain animals, certain uh, fauna and flora, I guess I should say. Uh, if these were that important, I would think that something would have been designated by this point. Uh, so, and I'm only mentioning that because that has been one of the comments that, that have been made. But beyond that, my question uh, as a follow-up to the previous one, uh, rather than uh, extreme grading, I. I would assume that you would be developing, uh, for instance, uh, roadways, driveways, uh, roadways uh, sort of parallel to the uh, uh, to the contours, uh, to and whatever other methods to minimize runoff. I, I don't know what value this land, this wetland down here is, but it seems to be it's 
there seems to be great effort in trying to preserve that and, and to stay away from it. So to minimize impact on that, would it be a safe uh, assumption that you would be d uh, terracing, I guess, would be a better description for the development uh, since it all does drain down to this bottom land. Yeah, I mean, uh, just generally in any design we do, we try to minimize earthwork because earthwork yeah. equals cost. Right. And no one wants to incur the cost. And with the kind of topo you're looking at here, you're, you're going to have different finished floor elevations of townhomes as it goes down across the site, uh, definitely. So you're not, you're not looking at a you know, big Walmart pad where everything's at one elevation. There, there's going to be definitely tiering as you go down the grade just to minimize earthwork for sure. Yeah, I, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Here's a question for staff. Um, there, there, most of us got that email asking about the, um, or commenting on the um, uh, diversity of plants and animals on this site. What triggers a review by the Natural Heritage? What, what triggers that review? There's a, a resource we have uh, called, I don't, it's a long title, Natural Inventory of Plants, Species, Animals, that we use as our resource. Um, there's a map that goes along with that, and we, we do review those maps in, in, to see if any of the applications we have in correspond to any mapped location. This site did not fall on any map, and that, that was the, the basis of our review and, uh, to provide any information. We don't have it. Anyone else wishing to speak? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move approval of Plan Amendment A1300008. Moved by Mr. Harris, second by Ms. Beachwood. All right, all those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. All right. Any Oops. opposition? Motion has passed, 12 to zero. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and Mr. Chair, I move approval of zoning case Z1300026. Moved by Mr. Harris, seconded by Mr. Smutsky. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. All right, any opposition? Motion. Motion has passed, 12 to zero. All right, thank you. We'll move down to item 6A, uh, Crowsdale Commons, case Z1300024. Mr. Chair, uh, before we start on this one, I uh, resign. Well, I report to work at this location, and uh, <clears throat> there will be no financial gains by me by sitting in on this. But I did want to let you know that I do uh, report to work at 1821 Hillendale Road. All right, thank you. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department. This is case Z1300024, Crowsdale Commons. The applicant is Glendale Hillendale Company, LLC. It is within the city's jurisdiction. The present designation of the site is uh, Commercial Center. Uh, the requested designation is Commercial General with a development plan and the site is 8.751 acres. The proposed use is 109,400 square feet of non-residential uses. The site is in the urban tier. It is three parcels at 1821, 1823, and 1855 Hillendale Road. It's uh, between West Carver Street to the north and Front Street to the south, which is on the uh, north side of Interstate 85 and the uh, interchange of, of Hillendale Road and Interstate 85. It is just south of the watershed protection overlay, which you see on this context map in the blue. The requested designation of commercial general um, has lot standards. 
and it was reviewed on the urban tier, which is, uh, we don't typically see a request in the urban tier, so uh, the difference uh, that we would typically see that I'd like to point out is a maximum street yard uh, of 15 feet. This, this slide is an error. It should be a maximum street yard of 15 feet, uh, and then all the other setbacks are as we would typically see in a suburban area. Uh, this site meets those, the criteria for this district. Uh, the existing conditions are shown here. It is the former Lowman's Plaza, presently known as Crowsdale Commons. It is, from what I could tell on the site plan, 98,691 square feet of office and commercial uses. You can see three buildings here and the uh, appropriate site layout with site access points. The proposed plan shows the same site access points and it does satisfy um, the requirements of a development plan. Uh, the difference I would say that this site is showing an, an additional um, square footage for development for building uses. Um, again, the maximum would be 109,400 square feet, which is just over 10,000 greater than what is there today. There's a number of commitments, maximum floor area I just mentioned, six site access points, maximum impervious surface at 95%. There's no text commitments associated with this. Um, graphically, the commit, everything you see is committed, including the location of the access points and the building envelope. There's a number of design commitments that uh, the applicant is required to address um, we don't have criteria for reviewing those, but the applicant has provided what was asked for the standards for design commitments. This request is consistent with the commercial designation of the future land use map. It also satisfies the um, review pol the policies for review for the comprehensive plan. All of those are met. And for that reason, staff determines this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Cool. All right, thank you. I have one person signed up to speak. George Stanzio. Good evening, members of the commission. George Stanzio uh, with Stewart uh, 115 Cofield Circle. Um, let's see here. Um, this is a this is a redevelopment project. Uh, I think everyone is uh, pretty familiar with Lomans Plaza. Um, it's been there for a very, very long time. It was uh, built in the late 60s. Uh, it was uh, renovated in the 80s. Uh, in 1999, our uh, client, Glenwood Development, purchased it uh, and operated it. Uh, Lowman's, the Lowman store actually moved out in 2005, and since then there have been a number of different uh, retail uses uh, including uh, exercise gyms, a Winn-Dixie, Loman space. Um, the development plans for this project started in 2008 when uh, Harris, Te there were two things going on. Harris Teeter was interested in moving there and at the same time there was a very significant road improvement uh, for Hillendale that uh, NCDOT was doing. Uh, so it took a lot of coordination between uh, what we wanted to do NCDOT and their project, but what we did get out of that was a, uh, was a full uh, movement traffic signal right at the entrance to the project, which um, has been very, very useful. Um, so a significant, um, significant in, uh, investment was made by, on behalf of our clients to renovate this project. Uh, Harris Teeter, uh, as some of you may know, decided that they would move to the, uh, they, they, they chose the 9th Street site at Irwin Square, which I believe is now open, um, back behind Irwin, um, Irwin Mills. Um, so our client began to look at other potential uses and redeveloped uh, this project 
um, into a essentially what it is today, a retail, partially retail, and, um, and uh, a Duke Health um, facility. Um, and uh, so that process started back uh, in 2011. Uh, worked with Duke uh, Medical Center to um, to provide a um, medical office building there, an urgent care, and um, uh, so the new um, uh, the new Crowsdale Commons uh, is constructed with 95,475 square feet of retail and office space. In addition to that, there is a new BB&T Bank. Um, Currently, there's uh, Duke Urgent Care, Duke Primary Care Physicians, car drugs, restaurants, dry cleaners, a UPS store. And the existing zoning uh, commercial center, uh, and we're, as Amy said, we're uh, looking to rezone it to CG, and I'll explain to you in a minute why, why we want to do that. Um, we do have a note on our on our plan, our development plan, that basically says, I'm not going to read it, you can see it in front of you, but basically says that we can't change the center without a, a rezoning or a new site plan. And the, you know, it, it's brand new, it's just opened, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the reason why we're here is really because we're looking to provide more flexibility within the center as it relates to office versus retail. Um, CG district allows for um, uh, for uh, a broader um, percentage of uses as opposed to the uh, the CC district that ties you to some some percentages uh, so that's really the the, the basic uh, reason why we're here um, you can see on this aerial uh, the BB&T is brand new. It used to be located just south of the site. It moved to this site. The Duke Health Facility is the long building that you see there. There's a pharmacy just south of that, and then uh, small sort of uh, support retail and resident and uh, restaurant just south of the pharmacy. Uh, some of you may recall this is uh, what it looked like for many many years. Um, it shows you the, the, the back of the, the facility and the front of the facility. Um, today it looks like this. Uh, it's, this is the new pharmacy. Uh, of course there's new signage on site. Uh, renovated retail um, and the new BB&T bank on the uh, northern side of the site. And then of course the Duke Medicine um, building. All of these structures were there. They've just been renovated um, and uh, again why you know why are we here we're here because um, we just are looking for a bit more flexibility so that and and some of it, it relates to even within the healthcare, the way uh, uh, services are provided there are certain health care services that are considered retail some that are considered office and we want to have the flexibility you know within the center to allow those those different medical uses to uh, to occupy the buildings over long periods of time. Um, so that is um, that is why we're here, and I'm here to answer any questions. All right, thank you. So um, it mentions uh, an increase in square footage. If you were to increase the Footprint? Would you have to uh, get a TIA? Mm -hmm. then? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Okay, that's what. I uh, well, above what we have on above the hundred and nine thousand that is on the development plan, we would have to do a new TIA. So, if you were going to, and, and the re the, you're the, ninety five thousand right now, right? Is that right? We're 98? at uh, ninety eight thousand, including the bank. Uh huh. Are you planning to? Frankly, it's all parking driven, so you know it's it's it would be very difficult to even add space. Um, believe me, we had to work some magic just to get it to work the way it is. So, uh, and a lot of times with medical uses too, they they uh, in particular Duke they they um, 
they usually like more parking spaces than are required to serve you know their clients so no there's no plans it's newly completed it's um, it's just done the way it is. this is really more about internal uses anyone else yes sir in the uh, in the development plan mm -hmm. you have one additional entrance that go out the rear of the property to the <clears throat> where the is that for vehicular traffic or is that for truck traffic Robert it's, it's just general vehicular. Yeah. I mean, the question, I mean, the concern is the additional traffic on that little strip. Right, and, and again, it, you know, if, if this were redeveloped, a new TIA would have to be done. It, it would include, it, you know, they'd have to look at potential improvements to the site or to site driveways and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's not anticipated in anywhere in the near future because it's a brand new project, it's done, it's just, just open. Um, but we wanted to have the flexibility in the future in case it was okay. redeveloped at some point in time. Okay, so there's no plans to do it right now? No, okay. no, sir. All right. Anyone else? We get a motion. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I rec uh, I recommend approval of case number Z1300024. Second. All right. Moved by Mr. Smusky, second by Ms. Beachwood. All, right. All those in favor, let me know my raising your right hand. Any opposition? No. Motion has passed 12 to 0. All right. Thank you. We'll move down to item 7A, the density revisions. Thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Uh, before you tonight is a text amendment TC 120012, uh, which is a uh, request initiated by uh, Horvath Associates as a privately initiated text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance to modify uh, certain density provisions within Article 6 of the UDO. Uh, the applicate the first uh, or the original application. Uh, requested something actually somewhat different than what's before you tonight after uh, revisions were made. The original application that's in your packet uh, requested a specific new type of density bonus uh, to be applied within the suburban tier uh, based upon an existing density bonus that's in the UDO right now that's only applicable within the urban tier. Uh, after review by staff and, and discussions with the applicant, uh, that that application has been modified to what is currently shown now. Very kind of a similar process as to uh, uh, the application that, that uh, you folks reviewed last time where there was an initial application and then through discussions with staff as to what was supportable and what wasn't supportable, it had been revised to, to what was uh, currently proposed now. Um, so uh, the revisions or the draft ordinance that's before you now has gone to the JCCPC for their comment and they issued no concerns with what is currently being proposed. And I will just uh, uh, quickly highlight what is being proposed within the draft ordinance that's in your agenda packet. Uh, first, the current uh, density provisions that are in the UDO, any of the fractions are, are being removed uh, so to to start out with a base density of just whole numbers instead of uh, fractional dwelling units. Uh, the second is to uh, adjust the current uh, residential suburban multifamily major roadway density bonus to include uh, projects that would front along service roads of limited or control access freeways. Currently that language is not in there. Um, that, is that part of it is actually consistent. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I'll move on to that. I'll discuss something in further. Uh, the third part is to uh, increase in the RSM and the RUM uh, densities that uh, could be sought with a development plan. It's a process that's currently in place with the UDO with the RSM and RUM districts where you have maximum densities that are allowed by right and then you have additional maximums that can only be approved with the development plan. Um, the proposal is to change only that number uh, to seek approval from the governing bodies uh, and those densities that are proposed are also consistent with the current comprehensive plan for densities that are permissible within the 
uh, or recommended within a comprehensive plan uh, for the suburban and urban tiers uh, accordingly. And then the uh, uh, other change is to um, link uh, current uh, density bonuses for residential development in non-residential districts in the suburban tier and also in the compact neighborhood tiers to uh, the respective, uh, uh, I'm sorry, density bonuses that are allowed in the suburban and urban tiers to not, uh, residential development in the non-residential districts. Uh, that's currently allowed in the urban tier uh, for such development, but aren't allowed in the suburban and compact neighborhood tiers. And we saw, and staff felt that that was reasonableness to maintain consistencies uh, uh, within the UDO. Uh, the applicant, um, Mr. Horvath, is here to answer any questions, and of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you. Um, anyone else wants to speak? Mr. Horvath? Horvath? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Commission, I'll be very brief, and it's more of a commentary. What brought this about was we are working on a lot of properties that are either in a current or future compact tier area near one of the station sites or adjacent in suburban tiers that are adjacent to the compact tier site, namely the South Square area and the Patterson Place area. And one of the things we discovered during that is there's a inconsistency between in the ordinance between certain conditions. And we're trying to get some of the commercially zoned property, general commercial, to be allowed to have at least a little bit higher density, i.e. the same that multifamily now can do. They can add one more unit an acre and to their bonus density if they front on a major transportation corridor. The exclusion to that for everybody is that it's, if it's a controlled access, it doesn't count. But if it's controlled access with a service road that allows connection for that development, it makes sense. A little bit of inconsistencies in the UDO, and quite frankly, I've been working with the staff for almost a year trying to muddle through that. We're not trying to grab everything. We're just trying to get a consistent level between urban, suburban, and non-residentially zoned property and residentially zoned property to get them all working the same and to support the future compact tiers. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any of the commissioners wants to speak? Yes, ma'am. Red board, then Mr. Gibbs. Um, I'm, I'm con very concerned about these fractional changes um, because it's just kind of thrown in here as a, you know, oh, by the way, we're gonna round these numbers out. But this is effectively a density increase and I really don't see any good reason for it because you're gonna multiply, if you multiply a fractional number or a whole number by a fractional number of acres, you're still gonna come up with a fraction. I don't see that anything has changed except that gradually we're incrementing the density and there's not really any justification given for why. The, um, it, it's a very good point that you bring up. Um, it was determined that uh, to, to start out with a base density at a fraction, um, although it's going to be rare that you're going to start out with, say, a whole, just a, a, a unit uh, or an acre, plain and simple. There may be instances that that happens, and currently that um, if you have an, an acre of development and you go by and your density is allowed at a fraction, you don't get to count that fraction. So whether you institute a policy of rounding up, you're still at the same point. If it's 10 and a half, you get to 11. The second point is that we felt that it was a very minimal increase in density. Um, again, the request that was initially uh, proposed by uh, Mr. Horvath was a much greater density uh, request in terms of the uh, methodology that was proposed. Um, you're looking at uh, much more substantial density increases that were allowed. So what staff felt was that um, the minimal increase of what amounts to about a well, it amounts to a 0.5 unit increase per acre um, was a nominal increase and was not uh, and was not inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. Well, I kind of see what you're saying, but I still I still don't get it. If the point is that you can't build 0.2 of a house, 
then the solution is to round up when you're all done with multiplying the acreage by the density, not to change the fraction to a whole number, because then you're not rounding up by one. You could be rounding up by a bunch if there's a number of acres involved. And I don't, what I don't see in here is I see the round numbers are really nice explanation, but I don't see a justification for increasing the density. And I would think that needs to be documented here. Ms. Board, if I might give it a try, Pat Young with the Planning Department. I think there's, there's kind of three elements to that. I think all of that is covered in the, in the brief staff report, but I'll, I'll try to emphasize the three points. Um, the first and most important, I think, is that what's being proposed here would make the densities in these areas consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, when the comprehensive plan and the, and the UDO was updated in 2005 and 2006, the densities were slightly reduced to the current fractional levels um, as a means of trying to in, encourage folks to apply for the affordable housing density bonus. So the thought process was we would lower the de maximum densities to what's in the current ordinance um, and that folks could come in with an affordable housing density bonus and get to the comp plan identified density. Um, I think what's clearly been established over the last uh, six years and then reinforced what was in place since the really since the late 80s in different forms is that it's not adequately incenting and it's it hasn't been effective and there's an ongoing process um, that's looking at ways to incent affordable housing but this doesn't appear to be it so the the original policy rationale for the current densities really is not consistent with the comprehensive plan and so that really what this does is bring the densities consistent with the comprehensive plan second and i think equally importantly is that any of these higher densities that are before you would have to be approved through legislative, through the city council of board county commissioners through a, a development plan zoning. So if there's site constraints or reasons that these densities don't work, the legislature, legislators can um, take that into account and not approve it. And, and I think third, and, and this is a kind of a more general statement, the areas that are in question here are really the areas I think outside of our um, downtown and, and compact design tiers that where we want to see density and we want to encourage density and um, that has the existing capacity or plan capacity to support it. So that's kind of three supplemental pieces to what I think Mike said very rightly. I'd be happy to take any further questions on that. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Gibbs. Well, my question has to do with uh, what, when you were, the basis for this change is uh, for areas served by service roads, uh, you allowed an in, a density increase. And my question is, uh, are these new developments, either this one or any other that this may apply to, uh, will those areas be served by public transit? The best way I'm going to explain this, it's not just service roads. Major transportation corridors, that is 15501, which is semi-controlled access, controlled access, it's mm -hmm. all of the above. Um, that's the control service road really applies more to 15501 than any other route, I-40, I-85, even 501 North Roxborough Road. But yes, um, most of the properties, and one, one of the reasons staff has taken so long to look at this is they looked at all the major transportation routes to see what impact this would have throughout the city, not just uh, the southeast or southwest area where I was looking at. And in doing so, that's where the first proposal I put forth ran into a lot of trouble. They had issues in other parts of the city, which is not what we wanted. So this kind of got narrowed down, and yes, where we're looking at is the rail corridor up from Chapel Hill to downtown and Duke, namely the South Square area along 501, Patterson Place along 501. There are properties along there that have commercial zoning that could take advantage of this that are adjacent or within the compact sites and near the transits. But there are other areas uh, along major co transportation corridors that it also will help, but it's got to also deal with the fact that it's one or a half unit per acre increase. That's, it's not a 10 acre, you know, I'm not gaining 10 units an acre, I'm gaining a half 
plus maybe one if I'm on a major, I have frontage on a major transportation corridor. Does that make sense? Yes, and, I, and thanks for your explanation. That answered another one of my questions, so we can move on. Okay. And I do appreciate that. Well. Thank you, staff. Right. Mr. Harris. So the purpose of this is try to incentivize <coughs> developers to include uh, what do you call it? Low rent, uh, affordable housing. No, sir. Okay. Well, my question is: Would this modest increase in density <coughs> be an incentive for the developers to include affordable housing in their development? I could honestly say no. The and we've had discussions. I've been personally involved with the planning dep uh, department on affordable housing. The incentives have got to be a lot more. It's very expensive to deal with that, and no, I, I'm not going to kid you or try to say something sideways. It's not an incentive. It is, as both Scott and uh, Pat tried to say, it's bringing the UDO into compliance with the comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plan, and please correct me, medium density in suburban tier is up is 12 units an acre. We're not even approaching that. We're talking 11 units an acre and a bonus density of one, that gets you to 12 units an acre. So it matches what the comprehensive plan says is within the suburban tier. Gentlemen? So it, it's trying to get an equal playing field and I think we missed a very valuable part for our city in redevelopment and that's a key. Commercial property like uh, was on Lomas Plaza, good example, but in my case, South Square area, there's a lot of vacant, old commercial property that can be redeveloped as a mixed use. And part of that is it's expensive to do both the commercial and the residential above, and the higher the densities that they can get on, even at one unit an acre, makes or breaks those projects. And I think they make for better projects. We're just trying to match up with a comprehensive plan and look at redevelopment. And that's, I might as well go ahead and tell them, the part of this that brought me forward was the old Pepsi property up in 501. Yeah, I know. Perfect. I think it's a great mixed use site, but it's not really heavy commercial. It's more of an office residential component right next to Duke University. Service road right there, two roads to get out. Shopping right adjacent to a compact here perfect location. It's zone general commercial. And that's what kind of led to this whole thing is we're trying to figure a way of adequately redeveloping that into something that's a good looking gateway to Durham. Mr. Chair, if I might, to quickly supplement Mr. Horvath's response to Mr. Harris, I, I, and I think I, I want to say this because this board has expressed so much interest in the area of affordable housing. I think Mr. Horvath answered very honestly, I appreciate that, that any individual project or any individual developer is not going to be incented to provide affordable housing through this very modest increase in density. But I would say, and I think this is an important point, on a sub-market level like South Durham or, um, you know, different parts of town or certainly on a citywide or countywide basis, um, the cumulative increase, the most powerful tool we have in creating affordable housing other than financial incentives such as direct investments, land trust, um, establishing land trust, is density. Greater density creates more affordability. There, it's unambiguous in terms of the research. So I understand there's other concerns about density, but it's a very powerful tool that contributes to affordability on a macro level. Dr. Winders. I, guess I, I, I would, I, I think some of the discussion has been helpful already, <clears throat> but I really don't understand, I don't know about, enough, I guess, about the uh, details of the current ordinance, but I wonder if uh, uh, you could, you talk about being uh, consistencies between the compact neighborhood and the <clears throat> and the suburban uh, in those locations uh, and I wonder if you could tell me something about uh, what problems are created by the inconsistencies that currently exist. 
I don't know that it's problems. It's, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Maybe that's the only way I can, and I'm sorry, I'm Hungarian. I gotta talk with my hands. <laughs> if you have a piece of property, let's call it 10 acres, that's zoned currently multifamily, and it's sitting along 15501, somewhere near Cornwallis Road. If I came in to develop the, or redevelop that property, it's zoned multifamily, I could do 10 and a half units an acre, and I get a one acre or one unit per acre bonus density because a multifamily along 15501, well, it's controlled access, but let's assume it wasn't right in there, and uh, I have 500 feet of frontage. So that's in the suburban tier. I'm allowed to do that if it's zoned multifamily. If the same property is zoned commercial, I can't get that one unit bonus. That's part of the inconsistencies in the UDO. It's not so much between the compact tier and the urban and the suburban. It's within the suburban tier itself there's inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we've worked with over the past year to try to get a, if you want to call it a level playing field, because in my opinion, I, you know, people do not, uh, landowners do not want to lose the current zoning they got, where they have retained commercial. So how do we encourage them to develop it as both, and, and profitable, they have to do it profitable, they're not going to do it, to redevelop it and still maintain a good product. And one of that is a small, and my client, quite frankly, uh, I got two separate clients, believe it or not, one in Patterson Place and one up north uh, at the Pepsi Place, um, are okay with the one or two units an acre. That half a unit on rounding up and a one unit an acre gets us at 12 units an acre. It makes the project work. And when we look at other projects and properties down along 501 and along Roxborough Road and 15501 business going downtown, it makes sense. These are older properties that need to be redeveloped, and it adds just incentive. It's a little bit of incentive. It's not great, but it's just that little bit to make it work. I hope that's kind of, but that's how we've gotten here. Yeah. Ms. Huff? Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, you know, we're talking about half an acre, uh, half, half, a, um, half a unit increase. But with RSM and RUM, you're increasing quite a bit the um, density, and I want to know what, why. The rationale for that is primarily consistency with the comprehensive plan. There, there are already tools in place within the UDO that allow an applicant to request those densities, but through different zoning districts, primarily the mm -hmm. PDR, which you folks are familiar mm -hmm. with on a regular basis. This is just another tool that um, uh, a potential applicant could seek if they're already at an RSM um, and you want to keep that designation or are comfortable with what uh, the development standards are within the RSM or RUM, um, then they might want to just seek uh, that rezone. It's still rezoning. Um, to it, but and they would still have to seek the uh, development plan. But it's sometimes uh, familiarity is is makes a lot of people more comfortable with with the zoning district. Um, so that was primarily it to take a look at those densities, um, maximizing the tools that an applicant can use, and also that uh, the city and county have available to them in terms of addressing uh, and having the flexibility to uh, allow for. Uh, higher densities. Again, the changes are for what an applicant can ask for. The changes are, no changes are being made that are uh, for at least for the RSM and the RUM for what's allowed by right. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it didn't seem uh, uh, logical to restrict what you could ask for, especially if what you can allow them to ask for would still be consistent with the policies that have been adopted already. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Beachwood. Um, yeah, I just I see this as a good way to incentivize um, increased densities where we need it, and a good way to incentivize um, mixed use. So I'll be voting for it. Anyone else? All right. Um, can we get a motion?
I move that we approve TC1 200012. All right, so moved by uh, Reverend Whitley, seconded by uh, Mr. Padgett. All right, all those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposers, raise your right hand. The motion has passed 11 in favor and one against. Thank you. All right. We'll move down to item 8A. Any uh, announcements? What do we have next month? Mr. Chair, we have three land use cases scheduled for next month. Okay. Uh, the second thing, where are we with the updated uh, members list? We wanted to get an updated members list out to all of the uh, various commissioners via email. Chair, yeah, that was mailed, emailed to you all the, um, the day, I think it was in August you asked me for it. Right. Okay. Is it possible to? I could resend it tomorrow if you like. Yeah, please do. I, I think shall I might do. have deleted That's, that I'll one. take care of it. <laughs> it's okay. Is that, <laughs> the dog ate the homework, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so any other announcements? Anyone else? Have all hearts and minds are clear, we'll adjourn. Merry Christmas, everybody, and Happy New Year. Yes, thank you. Be safe. All right.